Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Foundations. Kind of a little bit like a thief in the night. He would come so oftentimes her attendants would keep the oil lamps burning, watching, waiting to hear, to, waiting for this surprise to come because this most exciting day was upon them. Foundations. Understanding the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. With Robbo Robinson and Mandy Warby. In the last program, we started looking at the main characters in the tradition of the ancient Jewish wedding and how Jesus is the fulfillment of each element. We're going to continue to look at that more in this program. I love all the different lessons that I learn when I get into the uh, Jewish foundations of the faith that I love so much. This one I particularly love because it, it's such an emphasis on just how much God wants to be in relationship with his people. Mm. Our God is not a distant God. He's not like the God's of the world. He is so interested. He is so determined. He's so passionate about being in relationship with his people. And of course, through what we've learned is that he demonstrates and describes his relationship to Israel as being that of a marriage. And now we see when we start looking at the relationship of his son come from that relationship that now wants to join with the world, to bring the whole world into this mm. relationship. And it's really something else. So we learned that within this tradition of the ancient Jewish wedding, there is the Father, who is God the Father. There is the groom, who is Jesus the Son. And there is the bride, which is the church, the bride of Christ. Mm. That is a collective from all around the world. Yep. And of course, in our last program, we looked at uh, the first few elements of this ancient Jewish wedding, the ketubah, which was the wedding contract, looking at how much the groom was willing to pay mm -hmm. for his bride and how valuable she was to him. Uh, the acceptance then, which was done through the giving and receiving of a glass of wine. Uh, accepting the wine made the betrothal or the engagement a legally binding uh, contract, like a marriage, but without the physical union at that stage. And then, of course, there were the gifts, which were given by the groom to his betrothed so that she would remember him during the separation. And that's what we're going to be exploring in more detail today, This uh, the separation as part of this marriage. Yeah, and this is, uh, again, it's so incredibly prophetically significant. Mm. Okay, so typically in these very ancient times, the typical betrothal period between uh, was between one and two years, typically. And it was during this particular time that the bride and the bridegroom did not see each other at all. There was no connection, n none at all. They didn't see each other. And they were m in busy making preparations for their marriage. Now, the groom would be in his father's home, and he was making and preparing a home for himself and his future bride to dwell in once they were married. And he was fitting out the home, making it beautiful for them to be together. And the bride herself... She would be at home preparing not only for the big day, getting her, her wedding gown and the rest of it, uh, but she would be gathering things that she would need for her future um, married life with mm. her groom, not knowing when he was going to come, but being prepared, getting herself yep. ready, making herself beautiful. The big day, I mean, at any any yeah. time, any, the day that a bride gets married is a really big special day. So she wants it to be beautiful. Yeah. Um, so the, the bridegroom is getting the home ready. The bride is getting herself ready. And they're both getting the necessaries together so mm. that they can have a family life together. And I guess that she's thinking the longer he's taking, the bigger the house that he's building for her. <laughs> but, <laughs> Quite possibly. Uh, we see this uh, in uh, the Gospels. In John, yeah. Jesus said to his disciples, In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I know. That's just a perfect <laughs> picture of what we're talking about. We we know that scripture so much, and suddenly in this context you go, wow, mm. wow, that's amazing. But not only that, but during this betrothal separation period, the bride was also required to partake in a mikvah or a ritual cleansing bath. Now, the word mikvah is the same word that we use for baptism today. Okay, And in conservative Judaism today, a bride cannot marry unless she enters the waters of mikvah. And of course, we know that mikvah or this ceremonial cleansing through baptism, it's to represent that this person has undergone a transition either from being unclean to clean, from defiled to purified, 
old to new, dead to mm. new life. Yeah. That's what this representation is. So the bride underwent that. And, of course, we are called to be baptised, not just in water, but through the power of the Holy Spirit as well. Yeah, well, I mean, Jesus, of course, was baptised in water and baptised in the Holy Spirit That's when right. he walked the earth. And uh, we see, I mean, there's heaps of different verses that talk with this, but uh, one in particular says, don't leave Jerusalem. This is at the beginning of Acts. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 1, verse 4 and eleven sixteen. It's repeated. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So the, the bride had to go through baptism or a mikvah and a cleansing. So do we as the bride of Christ. Now, also during this betrothal period of, of separation, the groom would be getting the bridal chamber ready. Okay, This was going to be the place that was going to be the place of the most intimate, the most intimacy take their pl- uh, would take place there. And he wanted to make it beautiful. Now, the groom had to build it to the father's specifications and the young groom... Uh, could only go for the bride when his father approved that everything was up to spec. Mm. And if somebody had said to this young groom, so when's the big day? He'd say, well, actually, I don't know. You'll have to ask my dad because he's the one who calls the shots there. I don't know that Mm. I'm getting married. It's up to my father. Have does we that, heard that remind you of something? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It's amazing. Of course, that's uh, found in Mark 13, uh, where Jesus said, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You don't know when that time will come. And so when you have that in mind, suddenly the fact that this bride, this bride had no idea when her groom was going to come – Typically, she'd be getting her all of her trousseau ready and all the goodies. You know, the glory box would mm. be getting filled up with all the bits and pieces. She would have had bridesmaids helping her get prepared. But she, in this context, she had to be watching. She had to be alert. She had to be waiting because the tradition was that the groom would come in a surprise fashion, mm. often at night time, and he would arrive out of the blue. Kind of a little bit like a thief in the night. Yeah, that he that's would right. <laughs> he would come. It would be a surprise. They'd just have to be ready and alert and waiting. So oftentimes her attendants would, you know, keep the oil lamps burning, watching, waiting to hear, to waiting for this surprise to come because this most exciting day was upon them. It was just that it was a surprise. They didn't know exactly when that they had to be ready. And that is a perfect <laughs> illustration, again, of what we're waiting for with, with Jesus' return. But it, once again, he told parables and stories that relate to this, yep. which the Jewish hearers of those stories would have just understood. Well, that's, you know, that's what we do when we have these marriage uh, celebrations. But oftentimes when we read those parables and those stories, we don't really get the full context of what it was all about. But it just makes so much sense when you understand that Jewish culture. Exactly. We don't understand because so much of this Jewish heritage has been severed. But you remember Jesus actually talked about the parable of the ten virgins being ready, watching, Mm. having their oil lamps ready. That's Matthew 25, waiting for the bridegroom to come because nobody knew when he was coming. But let's not forget, Revelation 19.7 says, Let's rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Mm. We are the bride. We're supposed to be preparing, getting ready because the groom's coming very soon. We don't know when. Yeah. We actually don't have to know when. <laughs> yeah. We we should be alert and watching yep. so that we're aware of the signs or the implications that he may not be far away, but we're supposed to be getting ready. Mm. Well, we talked a couple of programs ago about the fact that Paul refers to marriage as a mystery. Yes. You know, and he talks about this in Ephesians 5, this very famous passage about marriage, husbands and wives, but it really is referring to that the bigger picture, I guess. And in verses 25 to 29, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. It doesn't matter where you look. You can't get away from this image of marriage that God is presenting 
that he wants us to understand of the kind of relationship he wants with his people. Mm. It would be God and Israel, it would be Christ and the church, the Trinity, the Godhead with humanity. That's the picture that we get. And we still haven't finished all of the ancient Jewish wedding tradition. Well, we will conclude this study on the ancient Jewish wedding on our next program on Foundations and look at a couple more of these elements in the wedding celebration. This has been Foundations, a look at the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. For study notes, resources and more, see vision.org.au slash foundations. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.